Good afternoon, if you're uh, fr coming from Australia, um, and welcome all to our third uh, Environmental Law Champions. Sorry, I'm just getting a little bit of feedback. Um, welcome to our third lecture uh, in this series from our Environmental Law Champions, our Asian Development Bank Train the Teachers uh, program. Uh, and today we're very excited that we're going to be joined by Patty Moore, who I will introduce in a short while. Um, but first, I would like to uh, invite Angelo to just um, present a short uh, video, an introduction about the uh, Train the Trainers Asian Development Bank Environmental Law Champions Program. Um, can I also ask if it's possible to keep your microphones on mute? Um, it's good to see people here with their cameras. Um, it's nice to see faces uh, on the virtual platform, but if you could keep your microphones on mute um, for the duration of the talk. And then after the talk with questions and answers, um, there will be the possibility to either uh, write a, a question in the chat box um, or put up your hand or open your mic uh, and be called upon to, to ask a question. Um, but first, um, we would certainly uh, like to introduce um, the Asian Development Bank uh, Train the Trainers Environmental Law Champions Program. So Angelo, if you are able to play the video, um, that would be wonderful. Thank you. Yes, we can. When I first heard about the TOT program, I was a bit uh, skeptical because I thought that I'm teaching for uh, nearly two decades, what else they are going to teach me. But after coming here, I'm really, really surprised that there's so many things to know and to learn and to adopt for myself. I'm happy to report that, you know, ever since I came back from the uh, TTT in Manila, the number of students has increased. The first set of students which I taught in 2015 after I came back was four students. And the next semester, the registration went up to 30 students. That was a maximum limit. And ever since then, it was holding steady between 25 to 30. And the students themselves came back to me and said that this is the first elective subject that they have enjoyed. I mean, the great value that I've seen of this TTT program is really the networking. They've now developed networks which have been fantastic and they've you know been exposed to other environmental law professors within their region and they're doing amazing things. What is surprising to me it is that after the TTT several of our professors um, started another group. That is not for the environmental teachers alone but also for the environmental protection agency, the local people who really go to the polluters to find. I never realized there were so many practical questions that has to be answered and what chemicals is toxic, why it is toxic, what's the legal basis, how much I should find. That's also uh, not only benefit those officials but also benefit the teachers because that's the real things, the real world. Yeah. It's amazing and uh, I think the group, uh, group is growing, growing, growing. By focusing on training the trainers, we create the infrastructure to ensure that this growing demand for environmental law knowledge is going to be satisfied. I think this has been probably the biggest success that the Academy has had to date because they've succeeded in mobilizing professors from all over Asia at a time when there's such a huge demand for improving environmental law and yet nearly all these universities lack the capacity to be able to teach environmental law because they didn't have people who had the specialized knowledge that the environmental law field requires. After uh, this ADB TTT program, I told my students, go to an affected area, meet these stakeholders, we will find out why exactly is this problem. For example, there was a lake nearby which was being encroached by a lot of uh, illegal occupants. So two guys went there and uh, met the residents. They went to the, uh, the elected representatives of the municipal bodies. They went to the government officials who are responsible for protecting the natural resources. So the, the moment when they reached the uh, government officials, uh, they got a point that these students are really going to make it a big issue. And therefore, uh, the government immediately acted upon uh, this issue 
and they cleared all the encroachments and they built a wall around the lake to protect it permanently. I think this is a small victory. As a teacher that I could inspire my students to do such a thing, the change should start from each and every one of us. Look, it's been inspirational, frankly. I've, I've found myself totally inspired by the commitment, the enthusiasm and the capacity of the people that we've been very fortunate to locate. So we're actually building a bottom-up resource now uh, of environmental law teachers and to, to which we're adding all the new people that are coming in through the training, mixing with the more older, experienced teachers in their own country and building a, a whole base there uh, to carry this work on uh, well into the future, which I think is one of the most exciting things of all, to see that this project has a, a lifetime, a longevity and a sustainability beyond the actual training. Um, so look, thank you very much, Angelo, and thank you, uh, everyone, for um, watching that video. It's a short uh, video that explains the work that has been going on with the Train the Teachers project, um, a program that continues over this, this year um, and is designed not only to reach out to the environmental law professors, but also to environmental law uh, lawyers and environmental law students. So that's hopefully some of the things that will be going on uh, in this year. And so one of the projects that we've uh, undertaken is this Environmental Law Champions uh, lecture. And it's designed, this lecture series is designed to promote uh, particular topics in environmental law uh, that are relevant to our region. Um, so it's with great pleasure that I welcome you to the third of this series. Uh, it was started by Professor Ben Bohr and then uh, three weeks ago by Dr. Jonathan Nilabad from the Australian National University who took spoke on human rights and the environment. And so today we're very privileged to have Patty Moore with us to talk about biodiversity law in the Southeast Asian region. So um, Patty is an environmental lawyer with more than 28 years international experience working in the field of environmental law and governance across more than 30 countries in Africa, Asia, Europe and Latin America. Uh, she has been living and working in Asia since 1999, and much of her work is focused on building the legal basis for conserving and sustainably using biological resources. Uh, Patty was a member of the team that developed the IUCN guidelines for protected areas legislation, and most recently in Southeast Asia, she was part of the team that has drafted a new decree on protected areas for Lao PDR. Since 2010, she has worked with ADB to carry out assessments in the of the legal basis for environmental and social safeguards for more than 30 countries in the Asia Pacific region. Um, she has been working with UNICEF, uh, United Nations Environment Program and the United Nations Human Rights Commission on children's rights to a healthy environment in the Asia Pacific region since 2018. She is a true environmental law champion uh, and it's a great pleasure that we welcome her on this Saturday morning to give us a presentation on uh, biodiversity laws in Southeast Asia. Thank you very much, Patty. The screen, as they say, is yours. Ah, thank you, Matthew. Now, let me see if I can give you a screen here. And here, can you see it? Uh, not yet. Not yet. Okay. Well, it's on my screen, so let's see. Um, let me try something else. Yeah, hmm, we tested this earlier and it worked perfectly. And now... Uh, I could I could share the screen from my side and uh, you could just let me know if I should shift over to the next one. Okay, well, let, let's, let me try one more time here and see if this works. And as we say, we can assure everyone it was working 15 yeah, minutes Yeah, it, it was working perfectly 15 minutes ago, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, we can see the screen. You've got it. Okay, now. Now. Thank you, Patty. Perfect. Got it. Okay, sorry, everybody. <laughs> anyway, thank you. Uh, good morning here in Bangkok. Good afternoon and even good evening. I know there are some people who are joining in, you know, at, the, at their evening time. Um, first of all, I'd like to say thank you very much to ADB and the IUCN Academy of Environmental Law for, for inviting me to do this. Um, it's uh, as as Matthew explained, it's work that I've been doing for a while, and um, and it's 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 really an opportunity to 
to be able to connect with a lot of you who are doing the same kind of work and, and more. And I hope actually that maybe after this, we could even have get into a little bit of a discussion about it as much as that's possible with this kind of a format. Um, talking about biodiversity law specifically, because um, there are four biodiversity hotspots in Southeast Asia. There are 36 in the entire world. But when you think that, that Southeast Asia is less than 1% of the total area of, of the world and only about 3% of the land area of the world, and you think that it's got more than 10% of the biodiversity hotspots, it gives you an idea of why you know, we need to be thinking about biodiversity law in Southeast Asia. So quickly, um, I'm going to run through constitutional provisions. We're going to look at biodiversity laws and, and, and the three um, components of biodiversity, which are ecosystems, species, and genes. Um, and then we'll look at framework environmental laws in, um, in ASEAN, and then specifically focus on protected areas laws. And the reason we're gonna do this is because it's been known for a long time that habitat fragmentation, degradation, and loss are the primary drivers of the, the loss of biodiversity. And protected areas are only one way that, um, that we can help stop that degradation and loss, but they're a very important way. So for, for those, I think probably most people in this group know very well who the members of ASEAN are, but just for those of you who may not be familiar with it, there are 10 member states right now. Um, you see them on the screen and I'll re just refer to them as AMS or ASEAN member states from now on. Um, so now just to start at the top of the legal hierarchy in, um, in each country, um, the countries that actually have constitutional provisions on biodiversity are Lao PDR, uh, Thailand, and Vietnam. And you can see that the, the, all of these constitutions have been amended relatively recently, within the last um, six to eight years. Um, and they range from, uh, from general um, provisions like in Laos that all citizens and organizations must protect biodiversity. Um, that's echoed in Thailand. There's a duty to protect biodiversity. But Thailand also says the state must conserve biodiversity and minimize negative impacts on it. Vietnam goes a little further, even in its constitution, and says that um, anyone, the organization or individual that depletes biodiversity will be severely punished. So you can see there's a range um, of constitutional provisions, and some of them from the general to the fairly severe. Now, there are other ASEAN member states that have constitutional provisions that have to do with natural resources and or the environment, but that don't mention biodiversity specifically. Um, of, of this range, um, Lao PDR is, is one of the ones that mentions biodiversity and then makes specific references to natural resources as well. Um, in, in general, the constitutional provisions on national resources are much more general than the provisions that we saw about biodiversity in the, in the three constitutions, uh, which got a little bit more specific. Yeah, here, um, some more, Thailand and Vietnam, again, like Laos, also have provisions on biodiversity as well as provisions on natural resources and the environment. Um, and Myanmar and Philippines actually specify which parts of, of the country or which uh, levels of national jurisdiction have the responsibility for legislating. In, in Myanmar, it's at the federal level, and in the Philippines, it's at the autonomous region level. Now, there are biodiversity laws and regulations specifically on biodiversity in a few countries. Myanmar is the most recent one. Um, in 2018. It regulates biodiversity at the level of ecosystems and species, but does not regula regulate the genetic resource aspect of biodiversity, which is biosafety and access to genetic resources. In Vietnam, the biodiversity law, which is now 13 years old, regulates both biosafety and ABS, 
um, in Cambodia, there is a biodiversity conservation corridor subdecree that is very specific and to, to corridors or connectivity, and it does not regulate biosafety or ABS. Um, you, we see here that there are most, you know, the great majority of the ASEAN member states have regulated biosafety. Um, the, in, in some cases, the Philippines, Singapore, Thailand, and Vietnam, there are multiple guidelines and um, decisions, decrees, lots of different levels of the legal hierarchy that do this. In, in four of the countries, Cambodia, Indonesia, Laos, and Malaysia, there's a specific law or regulation that, that regulates biodiversity, biosafety. For ABS, um, again, there are not quite as many countries have regulated ABS as have regulated biosafety, but the earliest one was the Philippines, and the Philippines actually was um, the first in the world with, um, with their order in, in 1995. Singapore regulates it uh, only through research permits, which are done under, under different regulations. But the other countries have um, specific laws or decrees on, um, on biotechnology and access to genetic resources and benefit sharing. Uh, as far as the ecosystem component of biodiversity is concerned, all of the ASEAN member states have forest laws with the exception of Singapore, predictably, which, but which does regulate parks and trees. Uh, aquatic ecosystems, again, are regulated by all ASEAN member states through their fisheries law. And that includes Lao PDR, which is landlocked, but which regulates um, freshwater fisheries through its fishery law. And then the other, the other ASEAN countries, which, you know, which have coastline and which do have um, ocean jurisdiction, and, and they also regulate aqu all aquatic resources through fisheries laws. Wetlands as an ecosystem type are regulated in five countries through, through different levels, whether it's through subdecrees, decrees, or a law. Um, and, uh, and there's, you know, we can discuss more about the, the fact that there is not really enough legislation that specifically protects and regulates wetlands and human beings' interaction with them. Species um, are regulated in one way or another in all ASEAN member states. There six, of the, six of the member states have specific laws on wildlife, um, in some cases wildlife and habitats, but they, six of them regulate wildlife. Four, four countries use other laws to regulate wildlife or wild species. In Cambodia, it's a combination of forestry law and the protected areas law. In Indonesia, there's a, um, a law on ecosystems and the resources in them. Myanmar, again, it's the newer biodiversity law, Protected Areas Act. And in Vietnam, Vietnam uses both the biodiversity law and the law on forestry. Um, the biodiversity in environmental, general environmental law and regulations um, is, is, is regulated in different ways. All of the ASEAN member states have general environment laws. Three of them have, uh, have environment laws that, have, that specifically mention biodiversity conservation. They have enabling provisions. That's Indonesia, Lao PDR, and Vietnam. And then six ASEAN member states have provisions that specify uh, protection for ecosystems as well. Now, Vietnam has just updated and amended its, its general environment law. The new law will come into force on January 1st of next year. And that new law will, it will mean that there are seven ASEAN member states whose environment laws have provisions on protecting ecosystems. Um, to just to give you a, a little bit of a breakdown of how biodiversity is reflected in general environment laws. The, the seven countries that, that have the general provisions are Cambodia, Indonesia, Lao PDR, Myanmar, Philippines, Thailand, and Vietnam. And you can see that the, these laws range from 1988 in the Philippines with the Environment Code um, to the most recent, which is Viet, uh, Myanmar with its um, 2018 law. Um, three of the ASEAN member states have environment laws that are strictly 
uh, what, what you would call environmental protection or pollution focused, and they don't have provisions on biodiversity or natural resources, either one. And that is Brunei, Malaysia, and Singapore. Now, now we're going to shift now and, and look specifically at the, the ecosystem aspect of biodiversity in ASEAN. And the, and the, the a lot of the resources for this part of the presentation um, are coming from work that we're doing by a project that is implemented by the ASEAN Center for Biodiversity, which is based in the Philippines. Um, when one of the four biodiversity hotspots in the Southeast Asia region is one single country. It's the Philippines. It's just listed. When you, when you look for the list of biodiversity hotspots in the world, the Philippines is listed all by itself as a country. So ASEAN's Center for Biodiversity is, is headquartered there. Um, it is one of, one of ASEAN's 10 specialized centers, and it's part of the ASEAN Secretariat. Um, the, we're, we're also looking at ASEAN heritage parks, which were first declared in 1984. Um, and now that the ASEAN Center for Biodiversity has you know, come into existence more than 20 years after the first ASEAN heritage parks were declared, uh, um, the ASEAN Center for Biodiversity is responsible for managing ASEAN's program on ASEAN heritage parks and for developing and managing the standards that ASEAN is setting for its heritage parks. The project that, um, that ACB is implementing right now is called Biodiversity Conservation and Management of Protected Areas in, in ASEAN, or BCAM. It's funded by the European Union. It's focusing on mainstreaming biodiversity into all aspects of national planning, from education to overall strategic and economic development programs. And it's also looking very closely at ASEAN Heritage Parks. So we're going to first, the, to give you a little background of the review that we did to try to understand the status of protected area law in ASEAN. We used as a basis IUCN's guidelines for protected areas legislation. We use the, these are the only guidelines um, specifically for protected areas law. The, um, the, the CBD Secretariat has not issued anything similar because it works very closely with IUCN and IUCN has already done this since the early 1980s. Um, when we're looking at protected areas laws, there are, there's a protected area law or decree, a very specific one, in eight of the ASEAN member states. The only ones that don't have a specific law or decree are Brunei and Vietnam. And for Vietnam, it's because they, uh, they have, uh, there are different ministries that are responsible for, uh, for managing their protected areas. So first, um, I think by, by now we all know that um, the, we, the world did not meet the IEG biodiversity targets. Um, if we look at it from the positive side, both globally and in the ASEAN region, they're partially met, um, at least in terms of percentage of coverage of, uh, of protected areas. The, the target elements that are remaining to be met, and this is according to the UN Environment Program's out, uh, Global Biodiversity Outlook number five, which is essentially the report card on the IEG biodiversity targets. What, um, what we're still looking for are identifying the areas of particular importance for biodiversity and ecosystem services, ensuring that those areas are effectively and equitably managed, that they are well connected, and that they are ecologically representative. Now, the, the, eco, um, the first three are, are covered to some degree um, under national protected area systems. There are four countries, so fewer than half of the ASEAN member states actually have either explicitly or implicitly a national protected area system. One of the reasons that a protected area system is, is important and one of the reasons that it is that a system is highlighted in the Convention on Biological Diversity is that it, with, with a system, it, there is a, it, it kind of forces us to look at what is part of the system 
um, are all ecosystems in, within a country represented within that system? And how well balanced are they? Where are resources going to support them? Um, so there, it's there. At, I know that there are some countries that argue it's not necessary to have a system as long as you have the protected areas, but there are great advantages to a system and particularly to system planning and what that can tell us for individual protected areas also. Um, payments for ecosystem services are specifically regulated in five, so half of the ASEAN member states, Indonesia, Lao PDR, Myanmar, Philippines, and Vietnam. And biodiversity corridors, or what is also known as connectivity, are also regulated by, uh, by five ASEAN member states, but not the same ones. Three of them are the same. Lao, PDR, Philippines, and Vietnam recognize both payments for ecosystem services and connectivity. Cambodia and Indonesia also um, uh, regulate corridors and connectivity. Now, when we get into the issue of whether protected areas are effectively and equitably managed, there are many aspects to this. Um, as, as we've seen, because only four um, ASEAN member states have, um, have protected area systems, and only two of those are explicit, uh, there's not much system planning being done in, uh, in ASEAN member states as it is today. So there is site planning, however. So there, there are legal requirements for planning individual sites in most of the ASEAN member states, and, and you can see that, the list on the screen. Something that's very important for protected areas is whether or not they are integrated into land use plans. Because if, uh, if land use planning is completely dissociated from protected areas planning, then it is likely or, or maybe like a given that um, there will be uses designated for protected areas simply because they're not even reflected on the plans that land use managers are working with. In Cambodia, it's only implicit in the land law that protected areas might be, um, might be integrated. In Thailand, it's partial with specific types. And um, in three other countries specifically integrate protected areas into land use planning. That's Indonesia, the Philippines, and Vietnam. Only three ASEAN member states require public participation in site planning. Um, now, there are more countries, you can see below, um, that require participation in actually establishing protected areas. But then once they're established, there's, there are few, relatively few countries that require public participation in then planning how to manage the protected area. Um, a, and there are even fewer that require public participation if there's any change to a protected area or if a protected, protected area is simply abolished. Um, only Cambodia and Thailand require the public to have any kind of involvement in making those decisions. As far as co-management of protected areas goes, um, the Cambodia, Laos, and Myanmar specifically enable co-management in all types of protected areas. In the Philippines, it's implicit that this will be done, but it's not explicit and it's not a legal requirement. And in Vietnam, it's a requirement for marine protected areas only. It may be done, and what we're talking about here are not necessarily, not really what's done in practice. Mm -hmm. We know that in, in many countries, and not only in ASEAN, um, actions are taken in practice you know, every day on the ground that are not required by law. But what we're looking at here is actually what the law says. In other words, what, um, what you know, government entities and citizens are required to do and for which there, you know, there is a penalty if you don't or there are consequences if you don't. Um, community protected areas and, and what ICCAs, which mean indigenous and community conserved areas, um, are enabled in the laws of uh, five ASEAN member states. And interestingly enough, in Cambodia, it's not the protected areas law that does that, it's the land law that makes that possible. In the other four countries, they are enabled by the protected areas law or decree. Um, benefit sharing, in other words, can people who live in and around a protected area um, expect to receive any of the benefits from the protected area? 
and in four ASEAN member states, that is, that's explicitly mandated by law in Myanmar, the Philippines, Thailand, and Vietnam. Again, uh, a big part of um, effective and equitable management is financing. Um, five countries create a fund of some kind um, for, uh, for protected areas, for protected areas management. Um, most ASEAN member states enable, allow donations um, to support protected areas management. Interestingly enough, in Brunei, it's cash only. I mean, some, some countries do allow in-kind contributions. Most of the other countries do. Um, something that is very important for individual protected areas is the ability to retain income that they generate whether they generate them through um, entry fees that people pay to actually visit the park, whether they're fees for licenses for camping or for using video equipment or for, for something else. Um, in many countries, all revenue that's generated by a protected area by, by law must go back to the central treasury or the national treasury. And then, uh, and then it's not always easy or straightforward to then have the money sent back to the protected area. In, um, in, four, in, in four countries, uh, there is some mechanism that allows protected areas to retain their income. In both Cambodia and, excuse me, five, in both Cambodia and Indonesia, that's site-specific. Site some, some protected areas can, others cannot. It's, it's, it, it depends on the regulation for that protected area. But Philippines, Thailand, and Vietnam specifically allow protected areas to retain the income that they generate. The other countries require it to go back to the central treasury. Um, if all ASEAN member states, except for Brunei, have a, uh, a legal requirement that the polluter must pay um, for any damage caused or even degradation caused in some cases. And that includes in protected areas. Um, uh, incentives for compliance. Um, the, what, what we have in the laws um, of, uh, of the ASEAN member states are not exactly incentives. I mean, there, Brunei, Malaysia, and Myanmar provide protection for informants. In other words, if um, it's, I guess it's sort of whistleblower protection. If someone sees that there's something happening, some illegal activity, um, those, you know, anyone who reports that can be protected in some way. Um, Lao PBR uh, makes it possible to give a reward for performance with respect to protected areas. Um, and, and those rewards can go to the general public, but other countries have rewards for um, government staff that, that perform very well in, um, in doing their jobs. But there are very few actual incentives for the general public to comply. And if we think back about the number of countries that allow communities around protected areas to receive benefits from the protected areas, we see that they kind of, we can go, it's not going back. Yes, benefit sharing. So you can see there are four countries that, um, that enable benefit sharing and, you know, and very few that provide incentives for, as incentives for compliance. And as far as the enforcement side of managing equitably and effectively managing protected areas, all of the ASEAN member states give administrative enforcement powers to the, uh, to whether they call them the wardens or the guards or, uh, or the rangers in protected areas. And the, the majority of, um, of ASEAN member states also give police powers to um, protected area um, staff. And police powers means the, the power to stop, the power to arrest, and if necessary, the power to seize um, things that were used in the commission of a violation. So finally, you know, looking over this, um, what, you know, what are ASEAN member states doing to, uh, to protect biodiversity, to conserve it and sustainably use it, and particularly the ecosystems. So all ASEAN member states had, have regulated either ecosystems or species or both. And that was even before 1992. So you know, before the, uh, the Convention on Biological Diversity. 
Um, since the CBD came into force, all ASEAN member states have amended their existing laws or they've adopted new laws. Um, five or half of the ASEAN member states have regulated biosafety and ABS. So you know, five, five states have regulated biodiversity generally and biosafety and access to genetic resources and benefit sharing. Three of those have regulated only biosafety. So when, when we're looking at, at an overall report card for the Aichi bio, you know, biodiversity targets, um, ASEAN member states, if you're looking at it from the glass is half full, then we're halfway there or we're partially there. It's, it's partially reg regulated. There is much more to be done. And what we hope is that the work that we've been doing on protected areas laws will will give um, ASEAN member states an idea of, you know, of what they can do and, and where, where, where states share boundaries and share ecosystems, where they may be able to find ways to harmonize some of their regulations so that it, you know, so that they would be you know, more, you know, more effective uh, management and conservation of protected areas and biodiversity. Um, a couple of things that um, that you all may know about or may not. Um, IUCN, the International Union for Conservation of Nature, has created what it's called an ecosystem red list. Um, you may be familiar with the, the red list of species, which um, uh, uh, which assesses whether individual species are endangered um, or or not, you know, that, and there are um, different categories of endangerment. The, um, now, the IUCN has done the same thing for ecosystems, and um, they have now completely um, uh, assessed 21 countries, which is a small percentage of 192 countries in the world, but at least you know, they're starting. And there are some countries, and Australia is one of them, that have done a great deal of work on, on assessing specific ecosystem types. Um, IUCN has also created a green list, um, which is not so much an assessment as it is a standard for um, effective and equitable management of protected areas. And, um, and countries have, have begun to apply for to be recognized as have their individual protected areas rec recognized and added to this green list. So there are, there are more and more different ways that are becoming available for, um, for countries to get information um, about this and you know, about different ways to do this. And, um, and, and also to, to think about how they may be able to increase their legal protection. Of, um, of biodiversity, protected areas, and the gen species and genetic resources. Now, there's a there's a another um, webinar, not part of this series, but it's one that may be mentioned that will be coming up next week, um, looking specifically at, at wildlife law. Um, that that I'm I'm also working with with that initiative, and and it is updating a manual that was created in 2015 for ASEAN on wildlife law. So six years later, um, the, 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 the initiative is on with the ASEAN Secretariat. Um, we're not as far into that analysis as we are the one with protected area laws, but, but once, the, uh, once the handbook is available, it will be generally available through the ASEAN Secretariat to, um, to anybody who's, who's interested. So I'd, um, I'd like to thank you for your time this morning, um, and I you know, look forward to questions and hope that we might even be able to get a little bit of a discussion going. Thank you. Thank you very much, Patty. Um, so thank you very, very much, Patty. Uh, I've also just added uh, a link to that free event, which is on Wednesday morning, um, uh, Bangkok and, and Philippines time uh, on the uh, wildlife protection um, uh, webinar. Um, and uh, we now have quite a bit of time for questions. Thank you very much, Patty. Um, and we have a few questions already asked uh, in the in the chat box. So um, I'm not quite sure if the 
um, uh, if the the Q and A um, or, or if the uh, the hand raise is is working um, in the but if you want to um, ask a question, um, please feel free to sort of um, uh, unmute or raise your hand and I'll also try and, and come to you there. Um, but I, I want to ask um, just the first question that came from uh, Nico Magdeo, um about the West Philippine Sea. And uh, the, the question is, knowing how diverse the area is, what is the possibility of having cooperation among ASEAN member nations having specific claims over the region to create a protected area in order to protect biodiversity in the area. And I guess that's a possibly could even be a, a broader idea about ASEAN cooperation for um, uh, multicultural, multi-country areas. And I'm perhaps the Coral Reef Triangle or the uh, Heart of Borneo initiative. Um, you could make some comments on that, please, Patty. Patty, here, you're on mute. I apologize. Sorry. Okay. Um, the, one, of the, one of the reasons that the ASEAN Center for Biodiversity is doing this, you know, this review of um, protected areas legislation and also looking at the standards that ASEAN has set in the past for, ASE, for ASEAN heritage parks and updating those is to try to provide a basis for ASEAN within the Secretariat to do exactly the kinds of things you're talking about. Um, whether it's looking at just bilateral agreements to manage protected areas on two sides of, um, of, of national borders, or whether it's looking at something broader in, you know, in, the, in the seas. Um, and I think those, those of you who are um, you know, professionals in the ASEAN region, I would I would really encourage you to um, get become more familiar with what the ASEAN Center for Biodiversity is doing, um, and encourage them to to take these steps, particularly you know where particularly where it, um, with respect to marine biodiversity, um, but also with um, respect to terrestrial biodiversity, because it's um, it, I, th I think we know that the just the protocols within any kind of a regional entity. Um, can can mean that things take a lot of time, and if there is you know citizen engagement and particularly from uh, from the professionals and the experts within the region, that that will also help to drive that kind of a process. But yes, and this is something that the ASEAN Center for Biodiversity is looking at, is very aware of, um, would like to do, and would would definitely appreciate support for. That you know, I I can't pretend to speak for the ASEAN Center for Biodiversity, but because I have been collaborating with them for uh, for several years on these issues, I know that this is something that's discussed with uh, within the ACB. Thanks, Patty. Um, and Anna, Anna Itkin, are you are you there? Would you like to come on and ask your question? Uh, yeah, sure. Thank you. I apologize. You. I can't turn on my camera at the moment, but um, thanks. My question is, and, and I believe maybe you partially at least um, answer it, is that uh, we know that uh, Indigenous communities uh, play a very important role in conservation. And it's been recently published that in many places they were actually displaced under the premise of um, let's set aside this area for conservation. They were actually kicked out of their traditional uh, land and, and homes. And I was wanted to understand if there's something uh, in laws and regulations that uh, already is there or perhaps can be introduced uh, to uh, promote actually their integration because once they, they are part of the conservation process, the outcomes are, are, are very good and, and much, much better than, than without, of course. And uh, we eliminate the negative externalities from this community. Yeah, I, I mean, what, what you've just said is an issue not only for ASEAN, but it's, it's an issue yeah. around the world. That um, there's that there's ample evidence that indigenous communities have conserved the natural resources that that they that they are 
that they count as part of their territory um, much more effectively than than certainly we have in the industrial age. But as as you saw from the review, um, there are only what the one half of the ASEAN member states even enable any kind of recognition of community or indigenous conserved areas. Um, and uh, now there, there may be some de facto instances um, and, and each of you in your different countries may know of those, but, um, but until there is um, full, the, the opportunity for indigenous communities and, and other, sometimes they're just called traditional communities to, to have recognition of the areas that they have been conserving and the territories that they have been conserving for millennia um, it will it will be difficult for them, and there will be there will be no legal basis for them to defend that. So I, you know, again, um, th these are the kinds of things that um, at when 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 you're looking at reform efforts with protected areas laws, um, or just you know, a country's uh, biodiversity law or environmental law. Um, the, these are the times to get that kind of, of provision into your national legal framework. I know we, when the team that was working on a new protected areas decree for Lao PDR last year, that's one of the things that um, that you know, we worked very hard to get into the draft. Um, as, you know, as most of you probably know, what goes in a draft is not necessarily what is in the final law or regulation. But um, but but again, these you know these are efforts that are they've been going on for years and they're going to be going on for many more years to come, and and this will require the you know the work of regional bodies like the ASEAN Center for Biodiversity, and and it will require the support of everyone in each individual ASEAN member state to do this to make the, to make this case and to and to continue bringing it up until it is actually part of the country's national law. Thank so, you thank you. Um, can just uh, focusing a little bit on that question of, of uh, indigenous issues, both in terms of land tenure within protected mm -hmm. areas and also co-management. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering how do um, uh, declarations such as the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People, um, issues such as free prior informed consent, mm -hmm. or that that development, and, and even the idea of a of a human right for a safe, clean, uh, and healthy environment, um, give strength to that uh, argument for legal uh, protection or legal uh, regimes to ensure that Indigenous peoples' rights are protected. Um, mm -hmm. is, is it are these opportunities um, that can be used yeah. as well to to then force that realignment or promote that realignment of biodiversity laws with those? Indigenous rights laws. Yes, of course, uh, of course, Matthew. That yeah, of course they are, and and I. But I think also um, it, you know, everyone is aware that each country has its own. Each country has its own legal system, its own you know, its own regulatory system, and its own set of of cultural uh, norms that guide the way the you know the country makes rules that to govern you know the way people interact with nature. Um, and and the way those tools are used is will be very country specific. Do you know what I mean that because there are there are some governments that that may not react 100% positively to um, assertions of human rights. Um, and and I think when when the it's an argument that can definitely be made, um, particularly in the case of indigenous and community conserved areas. And, and I think it will be as much in the, the art of persuasion and the way in which those arguments are made um, as it will be in uh, that to be able to at least get to the content. Because in, in some cases, um, simply raising an issue in, in, in a way that is provocative can close doors. So I think um, in, in many cases also, we need to learn to be um, uh, better negotiators, better persuaders, um, and and learn how to bring the, all of these, you know, diverse threads: um, human rights, environmental rights. Um, it, you know, like we could look at animal welfare, um, the rights that have that some countries are beginning to recognize for like living ecosystems and and living things. 
Um, all of these can be brought together, but, but they will need to be pulled in by the people in each country who understand the most effective way to make those arguments in that country's language, because the words can change, and in the cultural context, the legal and cultural context of each individual country. You can say a lot at the global and regional level, but, but when it comes right down to it, it has to be contextualized locally. That's that's my personal opinion. I feel um, like I, I do a lot of work at the regional level, you know, global level, but it 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 it, it all comes down to um, to the people who are working on grant, which is all of you who are in this in this webinar right now. Yeah, and and your your answer sounds like a, a lawyer who's worked for twenty years <laughs> in Southeast Asia amongst thirty different countries. Um, so I was going to ask. Um, Chen Kok On um, from Forever Sabah, would you like to come on? Um, because I think this then leads into to your question. Um, so please, if you would like to um, provide a question or a, or a comment. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I just saw the, I was following the presentation and then I saw you mentioning uh, Malaysia. I'm from Malaysia. So I just want to point out that due to the unique federal system of Malaysia, forests and uh, in fact, uh, rivers and uh, fisheries and all that, uh, they are mostly under state jurisdiction. So if you're looking for federal legislation on forestry, for example, you might not find it. Um, I pointed out in my comment that uh, you should also look at the states of Sabah and Sarawak because these two states are located on the Borneo Island. So they have their own a separate forestry enactment, mm -hmm. as well as other environmental protection law. Uh, since I'm here, I would like to ask a question as well. In terms of uh, the, the various biodiversity uh, protection uh, law in ASEAN, could you point to some specific examples of what, uh, which country's law do you think is doing uh, a fantastic job, you know, that, that other countries can learn from. And specifically, I'm just wondering, other than protecting the area, the biodiversity hotspot, as, uh, so to speak, from intrusion, from being uh, opened up, is there any other more innovative way uh, to, to protect that area? At the same time, uh, it could be put to productive use. You know, um, and, and is there any example of countries which have done it uh, uh, well or relatively well? Thank you. Okay, thanks. Thanks for the good. First of all, yes, um, I, you know, I, I, I didn't go into detail on Malaysia, but um, for the review of protected areas law, um, we have definitely taken Sabah and Sarawak into account. Um, the you know, actual the the documentation analyzing Malaysia's law is probably the longest of all of them. You can imagine why. <laughs> so it's it's all in there. But we have not done a, a similar evaluation only of forest laws. That's that's that that's another issue. I mean, what we were working on um, for the ASEAN Center for Biodiversity was specifically focused on protected areas laws. Um, at, with the work that's being done right now to update the ASEAN Handbook on Wildlife Law, we'll, pretty soon we'll have a good overview of protected areas law, a, a good updated overview of wildlife law. And you're right, the same thing needs to be done for forest law. Um, Lao PDR just enacted, just in 2019, um, adopted a new forest law, which I believe is the newest in the region right now. Um, so you're right, it's, it's a good time to do that. And, and those of us who are working at the regional level need to think about the getting together and see if we can find a way to, to make that happen. So thank you. You're right. Then who's, who's doing everything really well? Um, it, it's when, when you look at all of these, the, each country in its own way does at least one thing really well. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Not, maybe not everything really well, but does at least one thing pretty well. Um, the, in terms of just a biodiversity law, an overall biodiversity law, um, Vietnam might be considered a, a good example for other countries to look at. That law is 13 years old now. Um, it is in the process of being updated, but that updating process is taking some time. Um, and I, I, I don't have a timeline yet 
on on when it would be uh, when when the amendment and the update would be available again. Um, what I would say is what what we will do when we finish the review of all of the ASEAN member states for protected areas laws, we will do a regional synthesis, and then that will also be available. And that you know that a lot of what a lot of what you saw in this presentation will be. It will be incorporated into that regional synthesis. There will be more, obviously, but um, but I think um, it's I you know, like I am very hesitant to say that there's any one country or any one law that should be a model for everybody else because that's usually a very bad way to do things. Um, the you you should never don't copy. Do you know what I mean? You can take good ideas, but um, but for every country, the good ideas that you take from you know from other countries' practice uh, and what, well, what we saw in the video that opened this webinar, uh, you know, environmental law professors saying that they were taking good ideas from environmental law professors in other countries all over Asia Pacific, but they still have to go home. And, and look at those good ideas in the context of their own national law and their own national regulations and their own curriculum. You can't, you can't just take what somebody else is doing and take it home and try to apply it. I mean, we, we know that there was an example of the, of a, you know, a country in the ASEAN region that had a, um, a very, you know, enthusiastic um, person who had studied abroad and liked the, um, the biodiversity law of the country where the minister had studied abroad and thought it would be a good idea to just copy that law, change the name of the country. And um, he was dissuaded from doing that, let's put it that way. Um, so, so I would say be very careful of anyone who offers you a model. Um, be very grateful for people who give you access to good examples and particularly to good examples that you know that have actually been tried and and proven to work in practice. And I'm so I have to I have to say something. I I can see Amado Tolentino, who I haven't seen in years, smiling as I say this. And <laughs> so Amado, you can come in and second me on this. I think. No? Um, also, um, what um, Chen Kong, what you were asking is, are there other ways to do this? Um, what there are OECMs, other effective conservation measures. Right. Um, and those those have really only been studied, looked at, analyzed, you know, tried to apply in the last five or six years. So the CBD secretariat has done some work on on OECMs. The ASEAN Center for Biodiversity is also doing work on on OECMs. Um, but though now those are going to be very they, they won't only be country specific, they'll be site specific because the, the other effective conservation measures that, that can be taken, there may be a range of measures, you know, that, that have been tried in different places, but there might be only one or two out of that whole range that would be appropriate for a particular site or a particular area. But, um, I'll, you know, I'll look in a minute, um, and see if I can get the link. But if you go to the CBD, um, Secretariat website, uh, and search for OECM or other effective conservation measures. I believe there's at least one um, CBD technical publication on that, at least one right now, now that you could use for a reference. Thanks. Thanks, Patty. Um, and I have a question from Miku Lagarde. Miku, thank you. Yeah. Hi. Awesome. Um, can you see me? Yes. Yeah, okay, I'm, I'm having really bad internet connection, so I'm not sure. Um, I want to ask about a lot of the things you said that interlinks everything. So this is regarding OECM. Does that take into account indigenous experiences? Because the debate now in like environmental peace building, for example, is that on one hand, there is a premium to be said on taking in scientific ways of, of um healing the area, for example, because you need you need scientists to be able to tell um, in, in the South China Sea this is the amount of destruction that happened. On the other hand, the, the flip side of the debate is that you also need to take into account indigenous experiences of, of managing um, environment because if you 
uh, just prioritize the technocratic turn in peace building, for example, then you're also marginalizing the, the voices of those who have been doing the same management and conservation that are effective in the past. So when these two ideas clash, how do you balance out those seemingly competing interests? And this reminds me of like, right now I live in Australia and the uh, in, during the bushfire, this conversation became even more um, more in, in your face, so to speak, since the common way of thinking about burning um, forest fires is that it's bad for the environment, carbon, etc. But then the indigenous have been doing it to prevent even bigger fires. So just thinking about the, the, the maybe scientific Western way and, and excluding indigenous experiences wouldn't really complete the picture. So in, ter- in, in, in the sense that they conflict, how is the balance to be made there? Mm. Yeah, um, it's a, ideally, ideally, your, your, your regulatory system, your law and your regulations would at least give you the basis for making that balance. Oh. But, um, but frequently what we see, and it, and it's, it's seen as a positive thing, is, is to say science-based decision making. Do you know what I mean? Oh. In other words, to try as opposed to political based decision making, you know, it's, it's what we're hoping for now. Um, but, you know, but as you so rightly point out, science based decision making very often excludes um, a, you know, the knowledge that is very definitely scientific because it has been tried and proved over you know, much longer than anybody's been you know, studying these things um, systematically, you know, in the industrial age. Um, and the what I can say is that, again, you it would be ideal to be able to have that enabled in a country's regulatory system. Do you know what I mean? And have consequences for not doing it. That's not oh. the case in most cases. As we saw, there you know there 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 are few, very you know like less than half of ASEAN member states that even recognize or enable indigenous and community conserved areas. So there's oh. a there's a Big, you know, there's a lot of work that needs to be done there, just to bring to, just to bring the governments of ASEAN member states around to the idea that there is value in, uh-huh. in recognizing these. No, it's um, more of mainstreaming indigenous ideas. And and then, um, I, well, mainstreaming is something that I mean, the word honestly, I think is has been so overused that it's become almost meaningless. But um, if when when you're talking about trying to mainstream traditional knowledge into you know decision making anything that you do um what what that's going to take again is going to be very very country specific and very uh-huh. local because um and, and 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 local in some cases um in you know indigenous knowledge varies from from indigenous group to indigenous group it it varies from country to country um, it, you know, it may be similar if, if there are similar species and different, different groups have learned to use similar species for similar purposes. Yes, no. But, um, but the, the w- mainstreaming is something that also is a process. You, like, uh, unfortunately, some people think that if you just get something in a law or you just put it in a regulation, job's done, you know, you're finished, all your problems are solved. No. That's where you start, because then that is where you have to be sure that that law is then applied and enforced, whatever it says. So so there it's really it's really two track for, you know, for all of us you know, who are working in conservation. Do you want we, we want to be able to see that the, the, the measures that need to be taken for conservation are legally required and that if you don't do it, and including if you are a state agency and you don't do it, there are consequences for not doing it. No? Uh-huh. But then what it was- if there- oh, sorry. <laughs> so- go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead just as to follow up on what you mentioned, I think I think it's important not to to be doing all these things. However, what if the law is not re- robust enough to be to to be protecting this comprehensively? What if like in in a in a jurisdiction where there is silence in the law? So how can we ensure that whatever um, conservation measures we're pursuing is actually 
beneficial, not just for the environment, but also for the communities in, in that environment? Well, there are, um, as, as one activist in India found out, uh, mm. you know, there, there, there are, there is substantial guidance, um, mm. um, available for, you know, for how communities can bring different kinds of issues. And it's environmental issues, human rights issues, what, what the tools you, you know, that can be used are and what some of the method, you know, what some of the methodologies are. It can get you arrested in some countries. Mm -hmm. And I, again, that's why I'm saying uh, most of this is it's it's very country specific, and, and, and in some cases it's very local. But you know, if your laws are silent, then there are two things you need to do. You need you need you, know, you need to do what you can, you know, by keeping these issues in you know in the public sphere, talking about them, bringing them up, talking with other people, expanding other people's awareness as much as you can, and you also uh -huh. need to try to change the laws. And neither of those things happens quickly. And we're not, and we're not talking about, you know, it might take a year or two or maybe even five. We're talking generations. Because if you, if you go back and you look at, you know, when uh, I think that the oldest general environment law, um, among the ASEAN member states is, is in Philippines, 1988, right? That's a, you know, that's a generation ago. That's one generation already. No, um, and you know, and and that that I'm not, and this is not a judge, but that law has not been updated. It may be because it is, you know, it's, it's still fully, you know, adequate for the Philippines, you know, even today, and doesn't need to be updated. But but again, at the same time, there are, it, you, you 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 cannot say that these things are going to happen quickly, um, and that they're not going to happen without a lot of effort. And it's and it's and it's going to take individual effort and it will take group effort. Um, within ASEAN, there can be the I guess you could call it peer pressure. Do you know what I mean? As as individual ASEAN member states begin to take their own measures and they they may be other ASEAN member states will take notice. But again, within ASEAN, you know, the, there's. Um, it, there's there because there's no interference in affairs that that ASEAN member states are not going to try to impose what they do on on any issue on any other ASEAN member state. So you know for you know for your questions about particularly with um, with traditional knowledge and, and you know and the human rights that are that are bound up with um, with biodiversity conservation, these are things that you know, if, if those of us who are serious about it. You know, we we spend our lives doing it, and and we know that it may be our life. Do you know what I mean? That's you know, and, and we won't see the end of it, or we won't maybe even see what we hoped for by you know by the end of our working life. Um, you know, I somebody used to ask you know people used to ask me what it was like you know, um, and I'd say it's you take one baby step forward generally, and then you take three giant steps back. And and I don't I don't mean to be pessimistic, but that's that's often the way the way it feels. But that that also is a, a little bit of a reflection of the fact that these are processes, and anything that has to do with regulation is very dependent on the the government that is administering any given country at any given time, and governments change every two, three, four, five years, and priorities can change. I know I worked in, in one country where it took them 17 years to get their wildlife law enacted. And this, this was a coalition. It was a, I mean, it was not in ASEAN. This was in, on another continent, but it, it was a group. It was someone from the attorney general's office, someone from the, the parliament's legal drafting section, um, a university professor and somebody else. And they formed their own little informal coalition and they, they, these, there were five of them. They kept at it for 17 years. Seven, that's, that, that's almost a generation. So I, I'm not, I, like, I, I'm definitely not the person who's here to offer anybody a quick fix. <laughs> Cause I've never seen one. <laughs> Thanks for that. So we, we, we're going to move on to a couple of other questions. So we've got a question from, um, uh, Sandy uh, Akamo and another question from Rocky Guzman. 
about um, marine issues. So can I ask Rocky Guzman to first uh, ask your question and then and then Sandy will come to yours. Um, and I want to finish off, after um, leave a little bit of time um, uh, because there was another question asked about compliance and enforcement, which I thought was a really good question that we can come to at the end. But um, uh, Rocky and and Sandy, Rocky, did you want to ask your question first and then and then Sandy? Sure, sure, Matthew. Thanks, Patty. Um, my question is really like in the context, like with the renewed interest in getting vaccines, for example, from marine resources, and there are uh, there are initiatives for bioprospecting. So I was thinking, how would the law and the regulations differ if applied to the marine context? Because I would imagine it would be different because there are no clear cut uh, users of traditional knowledge as opposed to terrestrial mm -hmm. resources and also the benefit sharing since uh, mm -hmm. there are no indigenous peoples per se uh, over marine resources. So I was interested if there were any examples of how it's applied in the marine context in the region or perhaps uh, anywhere else in the world. Well, no, I, 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 I'm pretty sure that even in ASEAN, there are um, indigenous fishing communities. I'm pretty sure. Coastal and, uh, you know, they, they may not be large groups, but, but I think there are at least, you know, examples in, um, in some communities, particularly in Indonesia. Um, the, I, but if you ask me if I know of any specific examples, you know, of how that's really, no, I don't. Um, there, with, particularly with respect to, um, marine resources, uh, marine connectivity, which, is, you know, is, is, has been studied for a long time, but is really only beginning to be understood and appreciated, uh, you know, in the context of marine protected areas, as well as fishing resources and just managing fish stocks, you know, um, that, you know, that work is ongoing. Um, I, I, there, uh, IUCN has a, a group that's been working on marine connectivity for, I think it's been a formal group for two or three years now, something like that. Um, and it, that I, I'm not familiar with with the latest things that have come out, but I can I can check with somebody who is a member of that group, and I can you know I can let you know what they're doing. Uh, you know, so so I can't give you a specific answer to your question right now, Rocky, but I can ask people who may have one. Thanks, Patty. Thanks, Patty. And can I just, I mean, just more of a general question about the application of the biodiversity laws to marine protected areas. Um, are they often considered separate? Um, do, do, do we have separate laws for marine protected areas and marine biodiversity or, or terrestrial? Um, it's one of those questions we often face. Yeah, depends on the country. Um, <laughs> yeah, this is, this is why I say, I mean, like, it, you know, it's great to do these overviews at the regional level or do the global biodiversity outlook. But, you know, when it comes down to answering a specific question, it depends on the country. Um, some countries have their marine protected areas as part of a national protected area system. Um, some countries have marine protected areas as a completely separate system, totally. So that the terrestrial protected areas would be uh, would be managed under one law, and marine protected areas, if they're managed separately, tend to be managed under the fisheries law, and they also tend to get conflated with um, fish conservation zones and and other you know, conservation measures that are taken specifically for exploiting the resource rather than conserving it. So it's it's a little bit when when you have your marine protected areas managed by the fisheries ministry, which is supposed to be trying to maximize um, you know the the income from um, from fisheries resources. It's it, there is a little bit of a tension there, and I think you can imagine that. No, so it then but then when you have your marine protected areas that that clearly it, it, some of them will have coastal areas associated with them, then where does coastal end and marine begin? Is it the high tide area? Um, it, and again, this depends on how different countries define their coastal zone. Um, and on some islands, the entire island, which can mean the entire country is the coastal zone. Do you know what I mean? So again, it, there's, there's no single answer 
for you know for how you do that. Um, the the but the biggest you know, the biggest issue is if you do have two different systems of protected areas, marine and terrestrial. Uh, how do you make sure that the government authorities responsible for those two different systems communicate effectively with each other to ensure that there is effective management? Because if if protected areas, inland protected areas, are not managed effectively, um, and you know, and, and also areas outside protected areas, there will be you know runoff impacts on you know the coastal zone and you know marine areas and marine protected areas. There definitely needs to be, I mean, this and this is 25, 30 years old, the old ridge to reef. Do you know what I mean? You, you can't look at a country's, you know, a country's marine area in isolation of what's happening on land in that country. So, but the fact that uh, that in I would say probably the majority of governments, um, most ministries operate in their silos. And there, there may be lots of interministerial commissions, and those will be as effective as the ministers who were involved at any given time, and also as effective as you know the prime minister or the deputy prime minister, whoever is responsible for the, the interministerial commission, makes it. Do you know what I mean? Because that person would need to call it, convene it, you know, and 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 bring the members in. So. Again, I mean, this goes back a little bit to, to Nico's question and other questions. It's it there, there's there's no one single answer. It, there are definitely answers that are not going to be solved by environmental law. Um, environmental laws can certainly help you um, and can give you a basis for doing what you what you want to do. But um, but even once you have your law, and even once your law says exactly what you want it to say. You have to make sure that it's applied and enforced. And that's what Matthew said was going to be the next question, right? Okay, so um, uh, so we've got a question from Sandy Akamo. Okay, okay. Um, thank you, Please. Matthew. Um, I, this is a follow-up to what uh, Rocky was saying about ABS laws, rules and regulations. So I, I'd like to ask what is the level of implementation of this, this law in the ASEAN that gives them the push of taking it further in the uh, currently being um, enacted or formulated law of uh, biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction. Uh, because currently the G77, where the ASEAN is part, is a member of, uh, is really having a hard time against the seeds, the small uh, island development states and considering that ASEAN uh, adopts or or that's where the hot spot is on biodiversity. So that's my question. Thank you. Okay. So, so, so you're asking what I, I'm not, because I, I couldn't hear everything clearly. Matthew, could you? I'm not... Uh, the, the question in terms of biodiversity beyond natural national yeah. jurisdictions right. um, the yeah. I, because there's obviously that discussion going on within yes. the yeah. ocean's content. I mean, is ASEAN um, looking at I any of these policies and these, these frameworks or ideas going, yeah. being brought into that, um, that mm -hmm. debate or that discussion? Yeah. Particularly the ABS law. Uh, the Do ABS. Thank you. Oh, access to genetic resources and benefit sharing. So are, are so we're talking about access yes, to genetic right. resources and benefit sharing beyond national jurisdiction. And it, and is ASEAN um, working on that? Um, that what I'm saying is, uh, what is the implementation, the level of implementation of the access benefit sharing in ASEAN that will give them the push to, to move this upward into the BBNJ. So it's like after... Um, reviewing implementation in their own jurisdictions, then how can they push it towards the the implementation in BB and J? Okay. Okay. So so you're you're asking first about the level of implementation of access to genetic resources benefit sharing in ASEAN and then how yes. would that translate in into B and J, right? Yes, okay. thank you very much. Okay, yes, yeah, sorry, I sorry. It's just like it was it the the connection was not really good, and I wanted to be sure I got your question before I said something. Um, first of all, um, the 
level of implementation, I, I don't have enough up-to-date information about specific implementation of ABS in all ASEAN member states to give you the kind of answer that I think you're looking for. Um, I can give you uh, some, some snapshots. Um, I, you know, for example, um, Lao PDR that, that um, has not yet been able to formally regulate ABS Nonetheless, now has um, now has designed its own contract for um, for you know anyone who comes in and you know and wants to access genetic resources. Um, they are you know the, the industry is working on you know developing you know their their standard terms. They have right now active I think only five or six or um, contracts you know, for uh, for access to genetic resources and you know that have benefit sharing provisions in them um, the and, but ev every country has you know has its own way of regulating and you know and therefore it's not it's not always straightforward to be able to get or access directly inform inf information on the level of implementation. I see that um, Professor Lai Lin Heng is here. She may have more information on, on implementation of ABS at the individual ASEAN member state level. Um, uh, you know, as you were saying, how is this going to, to translate into areas beyond national jurisdiction? That, that is a question that, um, that you know, as Matthew and you have, have pointed out, um, the, the entire world is still wrestling with. Um, I don't think there are any clear answers yet. Everybody's still working on it. Um, and, but, but I think what your question implies is that if ASEAN member states are not um, effectively and equitably implementing their own national measures on access to genetic resources and benefit sharing, it will be difficult when it comes time to expand that to areas beyond national jurisdiction. Is that is that where you were going? I think I think uh, in a way that's it. Uh, yeah. Although I'm saying is that the protection to not just the the exploitation of genetic material, but then the protecting our genetic material because uh, there are a lot of um, poaching going on. And then um, uh, the improper patent uh, mm -hmm. with with the source not even uh, properly recognized. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, oh yeah, and um, and and clearly for um, <clears throat> particularly for for the the smaller you know the smaller countries in um, in ASEAN, their there are opportunities for um, you know for enforcement on a contract. For example, uh, you know just let's just say you know a, a European company signs an agreement, you know signs a contract to access genetic resources from you know from from a small you know from a small ASEAN country, takes those back and then does whatever it pleases with them. And you know, and I've had lawyers in countries just say like we can't even afford to go to arbitration. You know, we, we have an arbitration clause in the contract, but we can't afford it. You know, international arbitration is simply beyond the scope of what our government could do. So, so there are there are also practical limitations. I mean, even even where um, the agency that's responsible in a country is is doing you know doing the best it can given the resources that it has. Um, so again, and, and we're getting to what Matthew was saying—the compliance and enforcement question that comes at the end. Even then, it may be beyond the scope of what an individual country could do to be able to defend its interests and its rights. And when you get beyond areas of national jurisdiction, it's even more complicated, obviously. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, thanks for those questions. Um, Professor Laling, um, again, one of our great environmental law champions. Um, uh, now that Patty has mentioned you and called, would you like to make Hi. any comments? Hi, everyone. I, I just wanted to say hello to my special friends, Amado, John Boyd, <laughs> and yourself and Patty, of course, I'm delighted to be here. I'm no great uh, authority, but I, I would say I agree uh, with all that Patty has said. I mean, firstly, if you look at the national level, I think um, there are quite a few countries that Patty pointed out do not have laws on access and benefit sharing. 
And uh, I think this is important because uh, I think each country needs to set up a system. Um, and Patty rightly pointed out that in Singapore, we do it through, the, through permits. So basically, you can't come in to do anything in Singapore uh, unless you get a permit, right? Um, but I think a question that has not been addressed, uh, uh, and it's a difficult question, is what the, the participants have raised in relation to the marine environment. Because when we talk about access and benefit sharing, I think we are at the moment just thinking of the terrestrial. But uh, there are important issues, same issues, you know, but how do you regulate, um, you know, access and benefit sharing in a marine context? It's very difficult practically, even though you have the laws. I mean, you know, people just go and take what they want, whereas, uh, uh, you know, it's easier in, in relation to the terrestrial environment. So I, I think that's important. Uh, so... I, those countries that don't have these laws, I think, should be a priority. But actually, I wanted to ask uh, 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 Patty a question re regarding EIA legislation. I came on, unfortunately, a bit late, so I don't know if you know there was any mention of EIA laws. I think it would surprise many of you that Singapore is the only country in ASEAN that does not have an EIA law. You know, and uh, we environmental lawyers are pushing very hard for an EIA law, but the government says, oh, we do do EIAs, but it's not good enough for lawyers, right? It shouldn't be um, on an ad hoc basis as and when they feel like it. But what is good is that the um, National Parks Board has now come up with uh, biodiversity impact guidelines. But again, these are all guidelines. Anyway, mm -hmm. my, my, my question is, and I, I, I am prompted because I remember in one of the training programs we did for government officials, and there were some lawyers and there were others who were not lawyers. A chap from Sri Lanka told us, you know, he said, uh, I wish we were like Singapore. We don't have an EIA law. You know, um, you can do so much more when you don't have an EIA law. And he said, in Sri Lanka, you know, we have so many problems because of the EIA law. You know, all the NGOs object and the, the process takes a very long time. And we have had people who wanted to invest in our country saying, I give up. I can't function in your country. I'm taking this project elsewhere. And my answer to him was very simple. I said, I don't know the details of your EIA law, but it seems to me it's not properly crafted. You need to have specific timelines. You cannot let, you know, the people, the, the public participation part overwhelm the whole process such that, you know, you can't move forward. But, but um, my question is, in relation to EIA laws in the ASEAN region, um, which country do you think has the best laws? You know, we, we know the, the constraints, you see, um, you know, the consultants, who pays for the consultants, for example, because this is a process that can be abused, right? He who pays the piper calls the tune, you know? So um, how do we ensure um, a good EIA law in practice and in, I mean, in, in, in substance and in implementation? Thanks very much, Patty. <laughs> is, that the, is that your only question, Lindsay? No, that's no, no problem. <laughs> So, no, let, Patty, let me, Patty, can yeah. can I just can I just yeah. sort of interrupt to give you a little bit of an out um, uh, in the time the you know few minutes we have available um, is to say that our next Matthew, sorry, we can't hear you. No, Matthew yeah. just froze. I think. Yeah, he just yeah. froze. Yeah, Matthew. Oh Matthew froze. Well, let me tell you just quickly. We focused uh, on that. The, um, the, so the, just to say, you can okay. say, please yeah. stay tuned for the next the next environmental okay. law lecture. Yeah, um, you may want to think about that in terms of your your comment about linking EIA with biodiversity um, uh, protections or or, mm. or even land use planning. Yeah, um, and and since you know we're in an Asian Development Bank um, webinar right now, um, the like I've, I've been working with ADB now for ten years on environmental and social safeguards, um, and I've I've looked at all the environmental safeguards of, you know, all the ASEAN countries and then some. And, and I will go back and say, nobody is the best. Do you know what I mean? Like um, there are some things that Sri Lanka actually does pretty well. 
No, but, um, but okay, that said, um, the Asian Development Bank has also started the process of, you know, reviewing and updating its environmental and social safeguards. Uh, and that, that process started third, fourth quarter of last year and will be ongoing all through this year. So, um, so the, the, and there will be a lot of public consultation as part of that process. So that, that will, that will be another opportunity for you know, everybody who's, you know, who's in this webinar to think about these things, not only in the context of, you know, what you would like to see ADB doing, but also what, you know, what you, what ideas you could take from these consultations can take them back to your own countries. Again, what we were talking about, you know what I mean? Like, like, listen to what, you know, what other people are saying, what's being done in other countries, what ideas come from maybe even other parts of the world, take it back and then translate it into your own reality at home. In, in, in fact, I, I, may I just say it just very quickly? I, I think that's a great idea because it, it occurred to me that maybe we should have also a book, um, relating to ASEAN, documenting what are good laws and cases uh, from the different ASEAN states. Um, for example, in the Philippines, I, I actually I'm impressed with your writ of Kalikasan. <laughs> and I think, you know, I mean, I'm speaking as an academic that we can learn from the different countries, you know. So if there are interesting cases, and of course, we can start with the Oposa case, which, you know, um, in today's language, we can say it went viral. <laughs> <laughs> many years back. So um, it would be interesting. So that could be a possible project that ADB might want to do. That's all. Thank you very much, Leiden. Um And can I also say that, I mean, one of the things that we've been trying to do with um, this Environmental Law Champions um, lecture series is really to try and look at some of these regional uh, approaches. Um, as someone who has worked in the region um, about 10 years, sort of half the time that uh, Patty has and uh, certainly less time than Laling and others have. Um, from an Australian background, I have been struck by the commonalities, but also the differences. Um, and some of those ideas that Patty has mentioned is that uh, the value in uh, um, bringing together, looking at that comparative analysis. It's one of the things that we did um, with the India uh, Environmental uh, ETTT program bringing together uh, some of these ideas. So our next um, presentation, which will be on environmental impact assessment, will bring together uh, sort of a, a regional examination um, of ASEAN. And I still remember um, when I first uh, came to a, a meeting about EIA, um, we had 10 countries, all of which saying, uh, we do it differently, we've got nothing in common. Um, but when you go into it, as Paddy's work, it shows there are a lot of commonalities, a lot of things that are are can be used uh, but as patty said we have to avoid falling into the idea of model laws but we can think about things that work you know yeah. things that are practically um able to function uh, in our respective um national jurisdictions or state jurisdictions or local jurisdictions and and certainly that's something i've learned very much from the philippines about the role of local communities in being able to make a huge difference because of their implementation of various activities, whether it's bike lanes or air pollution or recycling or, or biodiversity protection. Um, I would like, um, and I know there's a couple more questions, but I would like to say thank you very much, Patty. We've, we've been here for an hour and a half talking about uh, biodiversity law on a, on a Saturday. So thank you very much indeed, Patty, for your presentation um, and the answers to the questions and thank all the participants for your questions. Um, it's been a great pleasure and I always find it uh, extraordinary um, having been an environmental lawyer for a long time, I still find it uh, fascinating how much there is to learn. Um, so, Patty, thank you very much indeed um, for your presentation. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, can I also say that um, when uh, Patty mentioned the Red List, um, we've got uh, a few um, websites that are in the, the chat box. Um, I've also put up a link to an Eventbrite uh, a, a, a webinar that's going to happen on Wednesday, which will look at wildlife um, protection. That's a free webinar. Um, so you please join and you're welcome to join. Um, can I also say that Paddy's presentation uh, will be uploaded on the website, uh, Teach Environment Enviro Law Asia, Teach Enviro Law Asia. And I think um, uh, Angelo will put that website up. Um, and if you want a certificate, um, 
Angela will also put up the web, the email. If you could send your full name to the email, apparently it's all done technically. Um, so please, Angela will put up the, the Gmail address and if you could send your name to that address um, for the production of the certificates um, of attendance for this workshop. Um, perhaps in closing, um, I want always to be optimistic. Um, Paddy mentioned 17 years to get uh, biodiversity law up in one country. Um, we know it's a long challenge. Um, but when Paddy mentioned the idea of ecosystems, uh, there was a recent report in Australia that they did a review of 20 ecosystems within Australia and found that 19 were close to functional collapse. Um, I think it's fair to say that we still have to remember that we are at a crisis point. This year is the uh, Conference of Parties for the Convention on Biological Diversity, um, which was uh, signed and approved in 1992, along with the Framework Convention of Climate Change. Um, how climate change links into biodiversity conservation is something that we're grappling with at the moment as, as animals um, and, and assemblages are threatened um, by climate change. But also urbanisation. Uh, the classic problems of urbanisation, of, of concreting ro um, roads and uh, fragmentation of biodiversity, um, the issues of the plundering of the seas, the issues of uh, exploitation of resources beyond areas of natural jurisdictions. Uh, these are all key issues. And above all, we need as environmental lawyers or environmental activists um, to get involved, to stay uh, well involved and well focused on the important thing, which is the protection of biodiversity. Um, can I thank again, Paddy? Can I thank all of our questionnaires? Can I thank our participants, uh, the Asian Development Bank for Angelo and Christina for organising it? Um, can I please say go to the website uh, next week when Paddy's presentation is up? There's a wealth of material um, and the uh, video recording of this will also be online on YouTube. Um, again, thank you very much for giving up your Saturday. Uh, we look forward to seeing you at the next webinar. Um, which um, thank you, Leiling, for point for giving us that uh, introduction for environmental impact assessment. Uh, and I'm sure it will be a very uh, interesting, uh, challenging look at EIA uh, within Southeast Asia. Um, but thank you all again very much. And please uh, have a very safe weekend. Um, and our thoughts uh, are very much with our colleagues um, from Myanmar who are at the moment going through a very, 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 very difficult time. Um, and environmental protection is one of the things that we have to think about um, in times of significant um, political crises. But thank you very much again for all your um, participation. Thanks, Paddy. Um, look forward to welcoming you again. And um, good afternoon and good morning. Thank you.